Well, why don't y'all take out your Bibles this morning? I bet you'll never guess if you've been here any time in the last several months what book of the Bible we're going to be in today. We're going to be in Revelation. We're almost to the end, just a few chapters away from the end of the book of Revelation. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 18 today. If you're using a Bible in the pew rack, it's on page 1038. Uh, 1,038. You see here, in Revelation, as we have been looking, this is the prophecy of the end times. And John, the apostle, the last disciple alive, is writing this down. Jesus came to him on the prison island of Patmos and told him, I'm going to give you a vision of the end. Just write it all down. So that's what John's been doing. And for a while, it seemed as though, reading through the book of Revelation, that things were happening chronologically. And then, towards the middle of the book, uh, John began to describe some of the individuals involved in the end times. Uh, it, it appeared not to be as chronological as it had previously appeared. And he started talking about the Antichrist, and he started talking about uh, uh, the believers, and he started talking about Satan. Um, and he, Then he continues on and he talked about some more stuff that's going to happen in the end times. And in the midst of that, at the very end of of all things, is going to be, as we saw, was mentioned last week, we're going to see a description of it today, what is called the fall of Babylon. Babylon was an ancient city, ancient evil city, um, that comprised as well a nation that ended up conquering Israel. Uh, But Babylon, in the book of Revelation, is symbolic of the evil world culture that will be anti-Christian, anti-God, anti-Jesus in lots of ways. And so here, this is the end of all things. Uh, Next week, it will all come crashing down completely. Uh, But this today, as we're going to see specifically, uh, will be the collapse of that world culture. So look at Revelation chapter 18 starting in verse 1. So remember, John is writing this. He says, After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. So this is a very important angel here. We don't get a name. It's just very important. Verse 2. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. Now that word haunt, it means like, like a jail, a prison, a place of detainment. Um, they are contained here on, uh, in Babylon, the world culture, for a period of time. Verse 3, for all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So this, it's not talking specifically about sex here. It's talking about uh, faithfulness. And Scripture does that frequently from the Old Testament on through the New Testament, uh, using that as as a a, a symbolic representation of faithfulness to God. So he's saying this world culture has led people to be unfaithful to God, has pulled them away from God and made them unfaithful to God. And it specifically hones in on the merchants here. The merchants have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So it's almost as though it was was, uh, presenting the idea that people were being made unfaithful to God so that instead of pursuing God, they're pursuing money and uh, luxurious living and um, things. I I know that's something for the future in the end times. That doesn't exist right now, right? Right? You don't see that anywhere in the world right now, but uh, that's uh, obviously coming, and it is now, uh, that the merchants so that people who sell stuff uh, will grow rich from the power of the world's culture and the luxurious Uh, living. But the description that is given of Babylon, this evil world culture, uh, is a system that has corrupted people. Uh, They have willingly accepted the corruption presented uh, by this world culture because they've been made wealthy in the process. They were willing to compromise their integrity, willing to compromise what was right, willing to compromise potentially following Jesus in favor 
of money because of what Babylon would give them. But the thing about corruption and, and perversion and the slippery slope of sliding into evil, corruption of one's heart is difficult to see when it's slow. And it's easier to accept when it's behind some sort of self-gratifying reward, like money or a promotion uh, or some, si- uh, some sort of, of you know, preferential benefit to myself. I'm willing to accept that corruption if it means I get something out of it. Um, that's the idea here. Uh, the world has been corrupted by this world's culture that we saw last week in chapter 17. Uh, the world's culture was brought in, this, this evil was brought in by the Antichrist who was being manipulated by Satan. Uh, and so look at verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven, so heavenly voice, saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So the voice isn't specified, but the one speaking says, my people, come out of this evil world culture, my people. Um, you know, this would seem to be God the one, is the one speaking. But what's so interesting about that is that this, this phrase, my people, it's used to talk about followers of God, believers of God, typically in the Old Testament of Israel, But this is the only place in Revelation where God refers to Christians as my people in this specific phrasing. Um, And he says, come out of the world culture. Don't be influenced by the world culture. Don't let the world culture take you into a place you ought not to be, doing things you ought not to do as followers of Christ. Because, as he says there, those who participate in the sins of Babylon will receive the full force of the plagues as they've been thus far described. So don't be influenced by Babylon. Because like a a rough stone in a river, continual influence removes resistance. Continual influence removes resistance. If you're continually influenced by one particular thing, it will remove any resistance to that thing, and you will succumb to it at some point. Whether it be a negative, have you ever been maybe on a daily basis around somebody who is constantly negative? Don't raise your hand. Don't elbow the person next to you. Have you ever been around somebody like that? What ends up happening is your brain begins to change and you begin to be negative like them because you're constantly around the negativity unless you have a more powerful influence in you to resist that negativity. If you have a continual influence in your life that is unshaking and you allow it to, to, to be within you, it will remove any resistance to that thing. And the only way we can be resistant to negative things like Babylon, like uh, the comments of other people, like negativity, like, like evil, like anxiety, like all this stuff, the only way we can resist it is if we have within us a more powerful force. If we are listening more to the voice of Jesus from his word than we are to the negative voices around us, maybe in our workplace, maybe in our house, maybe in our friends, maybe in our text thread, maybe in our social media news feed, if we listen more to the voice of Jesus than those things, then our mind will not be as impacted by the negativity because we will be operating against the flow of traffic and he will empower us to continue to walk in that way. Continual influence removes resistance. And so the call here to Christians, come out of Babylon. Don't let Babylon, the evil world culture, take you down with her. And then we get a call to judgment of the world culture. Look at verse 6. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. 
For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. So Babylon has glorified herself above every other, and she's to be punished in the same manner, having glorified herself above all others. Similar to Herod in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 12, when he glorified himself above God, and God struck him dead on the spot. Babylon is, is receiving glory that ought to be God's. But it says she's going to get a, a, a double portion of judgment. Now, this happens several times in Scripture. A double portion doled out on individuals. Uh, but uh, it is most often, uh, I would almost say every time, uh, but I can't say that absolutely. I think it's most often. I, I really think it's all the time. Uh, the double portion is doled out on those who are leading others into sin. Because the individual is sinning, and the individual is causing someone else to sin. So that's it's two sins. So receiving a double portion is because of their own sin and leading others into sin. And so here, Babylon, not only the world culture being led by the Antichrist, is sinning in doing the evil, the, the, they are also leading others to do the evil along with them. And so the call is, may they be, receive all the judgment that is due them as the evil world culture that is being laid out here. But as we've seen previously in the book of Revelation, it's not simply a world culture. It's a world culture that will be wrapped up into a religion that is flowing away from God the Father and into its own messed up, uh, perverted religion, religious practices. And so it's going to be judged quickly. It's going to be judged severely uh, because of how far the world system has led people away from God. Uh, look at verse 9. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality, again, faithfulness, unfaithfulness, and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. And they will stand far off in fear of her torment. And say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. So they call out, alas. That's a, a, a state of intense distress. They're crying out here. They will weep and wail as Babylon comes crashing down. But we also saw previously they were involved in bringing her down in the destruction of Babylon, using up all her resources and didn't care if she fell because of how much they were benefited uh, uh, from the evil world culture. So as the world's culture is collapsing, notice it says these individuals, the, king, the leaders, are standing far off. They're, so they're standing away. They're seeing Babylon, the world culture, collapse, but they're not near it because they don't want to get caught up in the destruction. So they're standing far enough away that they won't get, you know, guilt by association type of deal, but they're being called out here just the same. Uh, they benefited from Babylon and they're mourning because of her destruction. They're shocked at the suddenness of her destruction. But they're not just, as, as we're going to see next, they're not simply mourning because the world culture is collapsing. All right? Look at verse 11. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her. Since no one buys their cargo anymore, cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves, that is human souls. So the mourning that is happening that comes from everyone who's selling anything, that's why this list is, is as long as it is. Uh, John is trying to be all-encompassing here and covering everything that's, that's being sold. He said every, the people who are selling anything in any capacity are weeping, not because the world culture has collapsed, but because no one's buying their stuff anymore. They could care less about the actual collapse and devastation it has and the impact it has on individuals. What they care about is how it impacts them and their pocketbook. They don't care that people aren't buying their stuff. They don't care they're selling slaves. 
They're mourning not for Babylon's own sake, but because of how rich she has made them and their potential further wealth will no longer be garnered. And just as a side note, I want you to notice the way this is talked about here by mentioning slaves, that is, human souls. You know, people will often, people who, who don't follow Jesus, will often say in trying to argue against God and Scripture, that Scripture endorses slavery. Nowhere in Scripture is slavery endorsed. Not in one place. Scripture talks about slavery in terms of it, it happening in the world. It's going on in the world. And if you look at the Old Testament, it talks about you better treat them right or God's going to come and get you. What we see here in Revelation 18, 13 is an association with the practice of slavery as evil. As evil. Scripture doesn't outright, you know, blast every evil that has ever existed on the face of the earth. The point of Scripture is to get people into heaven, get people to God. And so it will talk about stuff that's going on in the world at certain times, sometimes not outright condemning it, not because it doesn't think it's wrong, but because the goal is to get people to Jesus. And we see here, he's saying, this is human souls that are slaves. This is wrong, is the implication he's talking about here in Revelation 18. And that's not a new presentation. That's not a new idea. Paul argues for the freeing of a slave in the book of, uh, oh my goodness, Philemon, Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave who got saved, or no, was a slave who ran away from his master and got saved under the ministry of Paul. Then Paul went and Philemon, the guy who the slave ran away from, got saved. And Paul says, you're a Christian now, you ought to free your slave. And so anybody who would argue that Scripture endorses slavery has not read it and is listening to other people. Scripture in no way endorses slavery. Jesus in no way endorses slavery. God, Old Testament, New Testament, in no way endorses slavery. But people do stuff that God does not endorse all the time. Y'all ever notice that? People do stuff God does not endorse all the time. All the time. Just turn on the TV and you'll see it all the time. And so here, slavery is mentioned as being something not good, that ought not to be done, that is a part of why these people are evil, because they're participating in this practice. Verse 14. That's bonus content there. That would be on the extras on the DVD. That's just extra. Uh, verse 14. The fruits for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. So the prophets are gone, the people mourn, they're sad for themselves, the lost potential money, they're not sad that the culture's collapsing, they're not sad because it impacts other people, they're sad because they won't get more stuff, they won't get more money. They didn't intervene on the collapse of Babylon, they participated in her destruction. Partakers in her punishment, they didn't want to be. Verse 16. Alas, alas, remember cries of great distress. For the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. That's the description of a first century prostitute leading people unfaithfulness with God. For in a single hour, very quickly, all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all who trade, and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off. They're standing away again. And cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. So we have the king's mourning, we have the merchant's mourning, now we have the transporters of the goods 
morning. The, the imagery is everyone encompassed, everyone who makes money off of the corruption that Babylon has instilled in the people of the earth are weeping because of Babylon's destruction. This world culture, this religious system. Uh, but again, the concern is not for the people uh, or what will come next or the possibility of what will come next, the possibility of rebuilding. The mourning is for the profit making, that it's no longer there. The loss of the ability of the world system to enrich the individuals, that's what hits the hardest. They start throwing dust on their heads. That's the uh, ancient universal symbol of mourning, throwing dust on their heads. The concern is over their loss of this financial opportunity. It is a demonstration of great selfishness and pride to only be concerned with how this thing impacts them and not concerned how it impacts anybody else. They are displaying great pride, great selfishness in this moment. I have a quote over my desk on a post-it note from Jim Cimbala. He's a pastor at uh, the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City, wrote Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. He said, it, he said this. He said, humility is a sign you've been with God. Whenever there is pride and arrogance, you know someone hasn't been with God. The closer you get to God, the more humble you become because you realize you're not all that in a bag of chips. The closer you get to God, your pride is broken. Your arrogance is broken because you begin to see how, relied, or how, rely, uh, how much you must rely on him. And so you need to get closer to God. The closer you get to God, the more humble you become. The more humble you become, the more you want to get closer to God. It's a cycle. And these people who, who are mourning for, for the destruction of Babylon have no humility in anything they're saying. All they have is pride. All they have is selfishness. And it's coming out in this mourning because they want to make more money. They want more. They want more. They want more. There's a quote from a biography about, at the time, he was one of the richest men in the world. And, uh, these, and he was off on vacation with another one of his rich buddies. They both founded these massive companies, tech companies. And, uh, but one of them was trying to get back in charge of his tech company he founded. And his buddy was trying to orchestrate a way they could get you know, some of their other rich friends to come in and just buy the company outright and make him the boss again. And uh, uh, that way they could make all the money. They could make all the money that this company is going to make. And the guy who had been ousted as the boss of that company looked at his friend and he said, I'm going to tell you this because I'm your friend. But he said, you don't need any more money. You got all the money you need. You don't need any more. And the guy said, I, don't, I know, but why should somebody else get it? <laughs> why should somebody else get it? There was no pride. I mean, there was no humility in that statement. He wanted it all and he didn't want anybody else to have any, even if he didn't need it. He wanted all of it. And these people are, are, are you know, more sad because they can't get more because of how they are impacted, not about how anybody else is impacted. And it's a demonstration, according to that quote from Symbola, that they have not been with God. They haven't been with him. So they don't know how to display accurate humility. Look at verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for, her, uh, for you against her. Now, this is speaking of something uh, that has been referenced before. It's going to be referenced again. Uh, but in the Babylonian world culture, that is taking place here in the book of Revelation. At this point, it's illegal to be a Christian. So Christians have been killed. All the way back at the beginning of the book of Revelation, it talks about Christians who have been killed, asking God, when will the end come? When will justice come for those who killed us? And here, the judgment is raining down on the world culture. Judgment on those who have killed the Christians. 
Rejoicing is being called here because of the realization of God's justice. Not because of a sense of vengeance, but because it's a realization of a characteristic of God's heart, justice. So the rejoicing is actually worship because it recognizes that God is exercising his perfect nature through one of his characteristics. Let's finish out the chapter, verse 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. Now the throwing of a great stone in a, a body of water, it symbolized symbolizes, and then it was talked about much in prophecy, the abrupt and violent nature of destruction. Uh, it's also used in Jeremiah chapter 51, this exact same imagery. A throne at that point was thrown into the Euphrates River, um, talking about the destruction of Old Testament Babylon. And here it's talked about again, giant throne uh, thrown into a body of water, talking about the destruction of Babylon, the great world culture will be utterly destroyed no hope of restoration be thrown down with violence will be found no more look at verse 22 the sound of harpists and musicians of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more so that's music of rejoicing and a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more and the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more so the things used to build stuff new things will not be needed any longer verse 23 The light of a lamp will shine in you no more. The voice of a bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. So Babylon is done for. The world culture is destroyed completely. It will never be returned to what was. I mean, it will never be returned at all. Nothing related to that evil world culture will return in any capacity. Everything associated with Babylon's prosperity will be eradicated right down to her intentional deceptions. And just as Christians were killed within the walls of that world culture, that judgment will rain down on it. And all that seems, you know, you read that, it, you know, it seems horrible, right? I mean, it's a reminder, though, that the Lord will take care of business and that evil will not win. But the thing is, justice is God's business. Making sure that situations are just is up to God. Because God is in control, not me. God has a plan, and God's plan is good. My responsibility is to live a life influenced by Jesus, even through difficult times. Live a life influenced by Jesus and not the world culture. Live a life influenced by Jesus and not things that would pull me away from Jesus. Live a life that is reflective of Jesus within me. And Paul writes about this specifically in Romans chapter 12. So flip over there, if you will. Romans chapter 12. Paul taught, we've just read in Revelation 18 what it looks like to be influenced by Babylon and the world's culture. Now we're going to see what it looks like when you're influenced by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. When you're following after him, this is what your life looks like. Paul writes in verse 9 of of Romans chapter 12, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. So let love be genuine. Love being a decision we make, not an emotion we feel. Let love be genuine. Purposefully, intentionally go out and love people. Abhor what is evil. That doesn't mean go out and abhor people. You're supposed to love them. He says it right there. Let love be genuine. You're supposed to abhor the evil that is in the world. You're supposed to abhor the evil that is in you and cling to the good. Don't be dragged down to the evil. Do so in this way. Verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Now notice in that verse, you remember, it's supposed to be being influenced by Jesus. Loving one another with brotherly affection. Outdoing one another in showing honor. 
There's no qualification in that verse that this just means people you like. That this just means people who also love you. That this just means people who also honor you. The idea here is you love them before they show love to you. You show them honor before they honor you. You say, but they, they don't earn honor. Well, it doesn't say in that verse that you only honor those who have earned it. It's the same idea in Scripture. Uh, we're told uh, by Paul in another one of his letters to offer respect. Not to those who have earned respect, but just offer it because Jesus is in you. So if you're a follower of Jesus, being influenced by Jesus, we should love one another irregardless of love being offered to us. Irregardless of honor being offered to us. In fact, we ought to be loving and honoring those who don't love us or honor us. You say, oh man, that's, that's difficult, that's hard. How in the world are we supposed to do that? Well, you're not just supposed to love and you're not just supposed to honor. How you do it also matters, as he says in the next verse. Verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. So how are you supposed to love? How are you supposed to honor? With all kinds of zeal and excitement. All kinds of fervency. Not reluctantly, not because you have to, not because it gets you credit with God, a jewel in your crown when you get to heaven. You do it because you got Jesus. You do it because Jesus is in you. You do it because Jesus did it for you first. We love because he loved us first and sent his son. Do not be slothful. Do you think Jesus waited for Judas to honor him before Jesus honored Judas by washing his feet? Jesus washed Judas's feet knowing full well he was going to take those washed feet to lead a mob to come and arrest him. Jesus loved Judas knowing all that was about to take place. Jesus, Jesus is the perfect example of what this Christian life is supposed to look like. Which is what Christian means, little Christ. We're supposed to be like Christ. In all we do, we're supposed to be influenced by him. So letting love be genuine, loving one another, outdoing one another and showing honor, doing it with all kinds of zeal and fervency. Verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. So rejoice in hope, rejoice even when tribulation comes. So rejoice and be patient. Rejoice in the hopefulness that Jesus is in us. Be patient when things don't look like they're going to have an end and they just keep coming and coming and being difficult and hard. And we do it by the end of that verse, being constant in prayer. Don't be slacking in prayer. Be constant in prayer. That's the only way we can be influenced by Jesus, through his word and through prayer, praying his word. That's how we get through it. Otherwise, we will be influenced by Babylon. We will be influenced by these other voices. They will come in and they will direct uh, the course of our lives because we are constantly influenced by them more so than we're influenced by Jesus. So rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation, difficulty, problems. Be constant in prayer. And never fail, verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to ho show hospitality. This is the one place we get a qualification here. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Take care of each other. That's Christian saints. That's not just good Christians. That's Christians all together. Contribute to the needs of other Christians. Help them. And then he says, seek to show hospitality. So the, quali the, 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 the qualifiers in the first part of the verse, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality, period. Not just to the saints, not just to other Christians, show hospitality to everybody. Everybody. Irregardless, again, going back to the beginning of the paragraph, whether they love you, whether they show you any honor, show them hospitality. Because you're not showing it because they earned it, you're showing it because you have Jesus. You want a real world illustration? You're not tipping because of how good the service was at the restaurant, you're tipping because you have Jesus. You think you're going to get an opportunity to share the gospel with the person bringing you food if you give them a 50-cent tip on a $100 bill? No. No, they're not going to listen to anything you say <laughs> at all. You go around the country and you ask any server in any restaurant what time of the week they hate the most. They have the worst tips. Sunday lunch when the Christians get out of church. That's a terrible reputation to have. 
show hospitality. It's all to bring people to Jesus. And, he's, and, and this is where Paul can anticipate people reading his letter. Say, okay, I'm going to let my genuine love only go out to other Christians. I'm going to abhor what is evil out there in the world and those evil people. I'm going to hold fast to what is good. I'm going to love one another. I'm going to love other Christians, only other Christians with brotherly love. I'm only going to show honor to other Christians. Well, Paul, knowing people are going to think that way, drops this verse in so that people can not think that way. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Persecute you, oppose you, speak bad about you. Now that word bless, that means speak good about. Curse in this verse, speak poorly about. So he says, speak good about people who persecute you. Speak good about them. Hang on, preacher man. You want me to speak good about people who aren't good. You want me to speak good about somebody I can't, you want me to speak good about somebody that I blocked on Facebook two weeks ago. You want me to speak good about them. Well, not just speak good about them. If the opportunity arises, post good about them. If the opportunity, well, I say the opportunity arises every time you probably see their name. You, see, you hear somebody say their name. Don't just speak good about them. Don't just post good about them. Think good about them. Because notice in that verse 2, it doesn't say bless them only out loud. Don't curse them only out loud. The idea is any time, whether out loud or in your own mind, speak good about them. Speak good about them. What did Jesus do when he was being nailed to the cross? Did he curse those guards nailing him to the cross? He asked God to forgive him. He asked God to forgive him. And when he's hanging on the cross, is Jesus crying out, woe is me, this hurts so bad. He's sharing the gospel with the guy next to him on the cross. Speak good about those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Don't speak bad about them. Don't speak bad about them about them. That, this verse should be, a, I would almost make this verse a challenge verse for any one of you this week. Don't let any negative word come out of your mouth about anybody this week. Just try it. Some of you, just, just try it for the next hour. You're about to go to small groups. You're going to do prayer requests. I know how those go. Don't let any negative words come out of your mouth about anybody some of you are going to walk out of here with bleeding tongues because you've been biting your tongue so hard. Mm, man, you can't hear me. Speak good about them and don't curse them. So Paul puts that in there on purpose, knowing what people are thinking when they're reading his stuff. And then he says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Remember, still, this is what it's supposed to look like when we're influenced by Jesus. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And he puts that verse right after he says, bless those who persecute you. So he says, when those who are persecuting you are rejoicing, rejoice with them when good stuff happens to them. Weep with them when bad stuff happens to them. Love them in this way. Continuing with that same line of thought, verse 16, you're influenced by Jesus, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, prideful, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Don't think of yourself better than somebody else, ever. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Now think about that. Repay no one evil. If you're influenced by Jesus more than you're influenced by the world, you will not be paying someone back evil for evil. They do something evil for you, you're not going to pay them back in the same way. They lash out at you verbally in an evil way, you're not going to lash back if you're being influenced by Jesus. So instead of lashing back in an evil fashion, he says, give thought to do what is honorable, even to that person who's lashing at you. If you're influenced by Jesus, that's what that's going to look like. So that he's, he's saying this so that we can know how we can better be influenced by Jesus, but also so we can recognize it in somebody else. That when they're not paying back evil for evil, 
but giving thought to be honorable, not speaking negatively about these people. They're, they're, they're being influenced by Jesus in a more powerful way. Then he does put a qualifier here in verse 18. He says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So what Paul is saying in that verse is you can't control other people. They're going to do what they're going to do. You can control you. You can't control them. You may be being honorable to them. You may be being loving to them. You may be blessing them and speaking only good things to them and about them. But you can't control what they're going to do back to you. So as far as it depends on you, no matter what they do, be influenced by Jesus and live peaceably as far as it depends on you with everybody. And then Paul goes back a little bit. Again, being influenced by Jesus looks like this. He says in verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heat burning coals on his head. Now you're reading that and you're going, I like that part. I want to throw burning coals at the heads of these people. Yeah, I, 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 want, I want to take a burning coal with my of glove and just smack it right in the middle of their forehead. But the imagery here is lost on us in, in our modern times because it was the idea of in a cold climate, people would go and gather coals to take home and heat their house. This is, a, this is a quote from the Old Testament. And so Paul's saying, instead of trying to avenge yourselves and pay people back, instead of that, let God handle that stuff. Let him take care of, uh, of bringing justice, raining justice down. Let God take care of that. You follower of God, you, you, you Christian influenced by Jesus, if your enemy those who are persecuting you, those who are coming after you, those who are opposing the work of God, is hungry, you feed that need. If he's thirsty, you give him water. If he's cold, you heat him up. You take care of that person's needs. So he's not just saying verbally say you love them, not just saying speak kind things, think kind things. He's saying put it in action and help them out in whatever way they need help. Help them. They may not be nice. That doesn't depend on you, their attitude. What depends on you is your ability to help them. He says, so help them. Because if you're influenced by Jesus, you will. Verse 21, so he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So if we don't do these things, if we are more influenced by the world's culture than influenced by Jesus, we will be being overcome by evil. Evil will be seeping into our hearts and our, our very nature and coming out in our actions and our words, almost as a joke sometimes. He says, do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good, because you've got the goodness of Jesus within you. Overcome evil with good. And we do all of these things that, that he desires us to do, being influenced by him, because he did it for us first. He loved us first in this capacity. He loved us in this way. He honored us in, in, in bringing salvation to us when we absolutely did not deserve it. He spoke kindly of us and about us and even his captors, even those, uh, Judas, his own disciple who betrayed him. Jesus is who we're supposed to emulate, be influenced by. Essentially, these things you read here, uh, things he has offered to us, we're supposed to give to others, is... is those who have been influenced by Jesus give the same to others that they have received from him. We give to others what we have received from him. The same forgiveness he gave, we give. The same grace he gave, we give. The same mercy he gave, we give. The same provision he gave, we give. The same love that he gave, we give. If we have been influenced by Jesus, we're supposed to give the same to others that we received from him. So the question then, who influences you? What influences you in your life right now? Your mindset, your worldview, what influences you? The way you've been raised, the friends you've surrounded yourselves with, the social media, the media? What influences you? The world culture itself how you're supposed to respond when you've been wronged. 
What influences you? Jesus or the world culture? What are you supposed to be influenced by as a follower of Jesus? Maybe right now you're sitting there in that green pew and you're thinking to yourself, well, feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you know, I've been influenced by a lot of things that aren't Jesus. That, 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 that's the sin nature coming out in that moment. The first step into being greater, being influenced greater by Jesus is a recognition that you need him. That you need him. You can't do it by yourself. You need him. And you begin to invest more in your relationship with him through ingesting scripture, through prayer. Will you allow Jesus to influence your life more? Or maybe now you don't even know Jesus. Will you listen to the influence of Jesus right now when he's saying, believe? Believe in Jesus. Believe that Jesus is God's son. He came and died so all your sins would be forgiven. And he rose from the dead so you can live after you die. Will you believe in Jesus today? Believe in him today. And you can be baptized. You can be, well, we don't have any water in there right now, but we're baptizing next week. You want to be baptized? We can do it next Sunday. So if you want to believe in Jesus, come and tell us you want to believe. We'll pray with you. I'll be here at the front. Jared will be at the back. We'd love to talk to you. Pray with you. Celebrate with you. Get you a Bible. We want every person who comes to know Jesus. We got a brand new Bible back in the workroom. Whether little kid, medium kid, youth, adult, we got Bibles for everybody back there. And we'll get you a brand new one today before you walk out of the building. You come to know Jesus. Come to know Jesus. Believe in him. Be influenced by him. Gain eternity today. So those two questions. Will you believe in Jesus? Will you be influenced by him this week?